everybody knows why we're here, right? It, this, it's always a weird thing to have to introduce someone that everyone already knows. Like, no one's here by accident, right? No one just wandered in. Um, he is an Academy Award uh, winning set director. Uh, he was second unit director on The Phantom Menace and Return of the Jedi. Done many things, but we're going to talk a lot about uh, Star Wars today and how it all started. So please, without further ado, welcome Roger Christian. <laughs> Travels with his own stormtrooper. <laughs> Is that in your ride, or do you, you have to have a stormtrooper yeah. everywhere you go? Armed and ready. <laughs> um, and one call, <laughs> the big black Darth Vader will appear. Well, but it, I don't want to spoil it for anyone, uh, anyone out there, but it, it turns out Darth Vader is not as bad as we thought. Anyway, I don't, if you haven't seen the, any of the Star Wars. Um, so, um, Roger, I, I, before, I, he's going to read a bit from his book, okay? Mm -hmm. We're going to get a, a reading in a bit, but I want to start with... Um, I told you before we we did all this that I, you know the year and I call it the original Star Wars even though the, all the episodes are all mixed up but I saw it I don't know who saw it who's from Guelph but who saw it at the Odeon right across the parking lot here now it's the Guelph Concert Theater but I walked out of there on a Saturday afternoon and for real <laughs> I I felt like my life had changed like I really did the things that were in that movie and the things that were in that movie a lot of them have to do with stuff that came from your mind so I, I want to just go back a bit to when you were asked to do this how did this come up I mean there was to me and I, like I mean I didn't really didn't see anything like Star Wars before Star Wars so how were you brought on board to do this take us through that process how you ended up doing this um, we were working on a film in Mexico uh, called Lucky Lady, which had very old, it was rum running in the 20s, so we were adapting old Mexican houses and buildings and warehouses into a different world. And um, Fox analyzed that Star Wars wouldn't make any money, it would make $12 million. So they gave the director three, $4 million and said, if you can make your film for that, we'll make it. And at the same time, the two people who wrote the film we were working on, Lucky Lady, they worked with George, they were at college with him, and they did some of the C-3PO dialogue and other things. They said, you better go down and meet John Barry, the designer, and me, the decorator, because he kept saying, I want a really dusty Western, that's what I want it to look like. And um, 20th Century Fox in London said at the time, we're half the price of America. <laughs> so George came down, I'm dressing salt factory I was digging salt and spraying it around and this car arrived George came his usual like student really in same shirt jeans and tennis shoes that he's always worn and Gary Kurtz in a cowboy hat and they got out and said oh hi we're come to look at what you're doing George actually started shoveling salt with me he's like that hmm. and um, we talked about it and he said I'm trying to do the science fiction film and I said well you know I really didn't like science fiction movies before this. I love science fiction, but uh, it's always been so plastic, audiences didn't believe it. He said, well, I'm trying to do a really dusty Western, like, well, look at this building here. And I said, yeah, this is all created, it's a flat. And we went around the back and it was, wasn't Nothing a real there, building. Yeah. So we got hired and um, went to London. We were then told, John Barry and I, and one art director, well, we've only got $4 million and we, having read this script, <laughs> thought, how on earth do we do this? Um, and by then we were trapped. <laughs> and um, I've, I always came through thinking outside the box. I never fo followed conventions. I didn't want to sit on a drawing board for 20 years and go up. I found a way to get through much quicker. So I just put my thinking cap on and we, um, I thought, I suggested one day if I bought old scrap airplanes and broke them down and stuck it onto the sets, I could give that old submarine look. And because George was an independent 
filmmaker and he made tea at checks. I wasn't fired on the spot. I mean, I, I kept suggesting things. I thought, I'm going to be fired any minute. And to put it in perspective, when we, we, we built R2-D2 first, because without the robots, there wasn't a film, and we didn't know how to make R2-D2. And um, we, <laughs> we, we built it with no money. I built who a carpenter we hired who made all of Monty Python's films, and they really had no money. Um, they, he brought some wood in from home. We built a rough R2-D2 around Kenny Baker, who we found, yeah. who was only um, three foot eight high. And he was strong, Kenny. We knew he could survive, because <laughs> it's not easy. And um, That was a nice prerequisite. Yeah. Well, Can you survive? Yeah. You're high. And are you strong enough? <laughs> yeah. But um, that's another story, but I'll <laughs> tell you in a minute. But then we... we decided the land speed it was also impossible so we started to build one and we built one billboarding wheelbarrow wheels that's really how we did it and some wood from home we built that built the beginnings of a wooden r2d2 and gary kurtz the producer his wife came down and looked round. we were in a tiny studio and there was no money then fox weren't green lighting it she just said boy this sure ain't hollywood is it <laughs> tell us a bit about kenny baker what is that story he, well, we, we, George, I don't know if everyone knows, he took the story from a Kurosawa movie who he revered called um, uh, Forbidden Fortress, and the two leads in it were two squabbling peasants. They were the storytellers. The main character was a, a wandering samurai. They told the story, so he took that and converted it into the two robots. Hmm. So C-3PO we knew was easy because um, they made Metropolis in the 30s and that was an actor covered in a gold suit and we thought we could go better than that now. R2-D2 was almost impossible and the special effects guys were very um, overconfident always because radio control hardly really worked. And he kept saying, oh, I'm going to have radio control, it'll do this and do that. And we said, you know what, we're going to have to have a little person work this so we found kenny baker who was in a comedy duo called the minitones there were two of them so we knew he was very funny and he had <laughs> he was always telling jokes and he was the right size so we built this wooden cylinder around him it's in here i can show a picture and um we need bill that the carpenter said i can't make a top roger it's impossible so i found in a junkyard a top of an old light that was used um, for film lighting in the 40s. And I thought, that'll do. And then I, I thought, you know, if I try and buy this, I'm the set decorator, they'll charge me too much. So I said, Bill, you go around. So the, he went around, he got it for 10 shillings. Jeez. And uh, which is, what, 50, oh. I don't know, 50 cents. Wow. And um, we cut the inside out, stuck it on top, put him in it. He was complaining all the time. Things were cutting him and we were putting in foam rubber, <laughs> cutting off bits of wood. And um, then Bill said, he's got little arms on the front. He said, I can't do those, Rog. So I carved those at home with a pen knife, and they're still there. And I, I went and bought aeroplane nozzles, where you, if you're in an aeroplane and you want some air, so you turn it. So I got That's those. That's all that is. I stuck those in. They're still there to this day. The little arms are there. I stuck another piece on the thing, and then we tried to get him to walk, and because he couldn't. Yeah. We just got muffled cries from inside. <laughs> oh, it's hurting me! <laughs> and <laughs> so we we uh, we decided, all right, let's put his boots, and we nailed those in the bottom of the feet where the two art legs are, and he kind of could shuffle it, and in fact George could come and watch this, and that gave him the idea he'd have him wobbling and shuffling sometimes yeah. as a character. He still couldn't walk. I'd bought an old fighter pilot's harness in the junk that I bought. And um, I just got this idea, if we, we'll stick it inside. So we screwed it in and he could wear R2-D2 like a rucksack. And uh, we got George and Gary down and he took four faltering steps and then fell over. <laughs> <laughs> if we could just hear him inside, get me out! <laughs> but we knew then we had a movie. <laughs> no, and, 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 yeah, that's, but what's interesting about that is, at what point, 
I mean, maybe it was the day it premiered and you went to see it. But at what point did you think, okay, this isn't going to be as bad as we think? This is this actually could be. Did you ever have an inkling while you were making it that, yeah, this this is going to be an, a, a franchise. This is going to be a huge deal. Not as big as it is. I, I, I grew up with mythology and, and legends and Arthur. So as soon as I read about the lightsaber, I knew, okay, this is the icon. This is he's taken what really everyone knows about King Arthur, which is Excalibur. Yeah. Um, and I, th I realized when I read the script, there's something here, this is going to work. The, the rest of the crew, apart from, and George said this when I met him when I was directing Second Unit on The Phantom Menace, when I first went to see him and he introduced me to Rick McCullum, he said, Rick, you know, there were only five people stood right by my side on Star Wars and Roger was one of them. And the rest of the crew thought it was a waste of time. They thought it was a fairy story, American, young student like a director. American culture was in the toilet at that time in England. Science fiction, nobody wanted. So the crew, most of them were just there to earn a salary and they were denigrating the whole thing all the time. And you can imagine, I mean, we, we were making stormtroopers that, out of plastic um, PVC molding. So they were clanking about on the set because yeah. until the sound is put on, it changes. Darth Vader, um, Dave Prowse was, um, oh, hello, or you come from the North Country then. <laughs> so he spoke like that. <laughs> and um, so it wasn't the iconic kind of feeling that, turned up at the end and really surprised people. So um, I believed in it the whole time. So did John Barry, bless him, the designer, and Les, the other art director. I don't think anyone else on the crew believed it. So yeah. it was a huge struggle for us all the way through because no one was really respecting what we were doing or what George was doing at all. And even like the first day of shooting, we had... Um, <coughs> It was the sand crawler with the lineup of all the robots, and I I had to make all of those and get the special effects. And before we went to Tunisia, John Barry, the designer, came to me and Les Dilly and said, "Listen, these radio controls aren't going to work. Build a secret lightweight one with fishing wire." And the first shot ever, <laughs> R2D2 comes down the ramp, bonk, falls over. <laughs> the other one crashes over. <laughs> George yells cut, and um, Gary Kurtz ran to us and said, well, have you got any monofilament? Which we didn't know what that was. It was an American <laughs> term. And Les was around the back to me going, what's monofilament? I said, I think he means fishing wire. So we put ours out there, and most of the Tunisian, all of the locations were done with a board and us pulling him on fishing wire. <sighs> and Kenny working the one, and then occasionally the radio controlled would work. <laughs> And to tell you this, we're in the desert, 45 minutes from a sleepy little town that had one hotel in Tunisia, which was full. We couldn't even stay there because Zeffirelli was there. There was like one taxi, I think, and a few carts, and the special effects on the first day of shooting, and then he was doing his radio control to make it work, and it just went zhuzh, bunk. <laughs> And he said, oh, it's the taxis. They're messing up my radio control <laughs> in front of the entire crew. And Les and I had to hide. We were, I mean, partly panicking and partly <laughs> laughing because that's obviously was an excuse he'd used in London where yeah, there were yeah. taxis and they radio <laughs> control. One taxi. It just made no sense in the <laughs> middle of a desert, nowhere. So it carried on like that. How was Lucas at? putting in people's minds uh, on the crew, I guess you especially because you stood by him, but how was he at, at making you understand what it was going to look like and what it was going to sound like when it was done? I think I was, you know, the, it's like the hero's journey. The hero gets struck at some point and George and I, he, he in those days, George was incredibly shy for a director and really didn't say much. And so, he brought with him Ralph Macquarie, who's the, the illustrated what George was writing. And Ralph is the unsung hero of Star Wars. Mm. George would say to him, look, I need a seven foot six uh, creature who looks like my dog Indy with hair. And he drew Chewbacca. 
That's how he came out. That's how he arrived. So George came with six Ralph Macquarie paintings. That's all we had. And he and I and somehow had a kindred spirit over what this used world would be. I, I, everything I made, the lightsaber, every weapon, the stormtroopers' weapons, the sets, he never, ever refused anything I did because I, we had the same mind somehow. And... Um, the rest of the crew to try to convince them he showed them once upon a time in the west which is Sergio Leone made all of the um, spaghetti westerns with Clint Eastwood which were made for very little money in Spain and uh, they're brilliant if you haven't ever seen them watch these early Clint Eastwood movies because they're amazing and um, we showed them and, and he finally got a bit of attention, Sergio Leone, and made Once Upon a Time in the West mm -hmm. in America with a really good budget. So we showed them that, and he kept saying, see the costume, see the dust, this is what I'm trying to get. Showed them 2001 and said, you take elements of this for the Death Star. And then what really confused them, he, sh he showed them Zeffirelli's, uh, um, Fellini's Satyricon. <laughs> and, but it had huge sets that he never went look at this set, he just filmed like a documentary within it and that's what George said I'm going to do hmm. and he felt the fault of all science fiction directors before was they built these amazing sets so they think oh we've got to show it and then you do this and he said if I'm doing a film and somebody walks in a door I don't go wow look at this building or oh, look at this details oh here he goes in the door you just goes in the door and he filmed Star Wars like that it's kind of documentary like hmm. um, so trying to convince her, and John Barry always admitted his preference was Barbarella. He liked all that fantasy yeah, stuff, yeah. but he understood exactly. He was brilliant at understanding what a director wanted, and um, it was him. He, he designed a film called Little Prince, and he took George to Tunisia, where yeah. having seen the dusty kind of world that um, Ralph Macquarie had painted, there it was with these yeah. ancient buildings and all I had to do was stick things in there and put up water vapors and I think that was it, probably for the first time in science fiction ever or movies that you believed the world you, yeah. you didn't question it and I think that was half the reason it connected so well it's um and it set standards you know and I, I I literally flew around England in a little plane buying up jet engines and again it sums it up I, I bought up so much scrap I bought 20 old Rolls-Royce engines and I bought scrapped airplanes and no one wanted it in that time there were scrap yards all over no one bought it so I could buy half an airplane for 50 pounds and I had the prop master was David Lean's prop master he's the big man in charge of moving everything countries and he used to work for Stanley Kubrick he mm. called me boy. <laughs> he said, what do you want, boy? And I said, well, you better clear the prop room right out. There's no room for tables, chairs, curtains, and all that stuff. All right. A 16-wheeler backed in. He came down. He heard it was coming in. I went down. I'm watching. And this truck came in with, I mean, it was high as this room, piled with airplane junk. And he didn't even look at me. He just said, "You know, you're mad, boy, don't you?" <laughs> and that's what it's. And that's what you. That's what it feels like to me. Like you're a mad scientist who, who it, it's. It's. I don't know if, if anyone's ever seen the Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, but where Dick Van Dyke's character goes into the lighthouse and right. he's just clanging away, and he comes out with this car. That kind of sounds like what you were doing. Yeah, we were. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, to to be honest, this the weapon here on the stormtrooper. I I. Well, having read the script, when I read a script, then you broke it down. How many weapons you need, how many interiors, whatever you need. You look at it, and then you have to budget it out. And I thought, well, I can't do any of this. I couldn't make weapons in the conventional way. They'd go in, they'd be designed, put into a workshop, made, and then duplicated. So I also thought, you know, I never believed guns in science fiction films. They were always plastic and went beep, beep, and no one believed that. So I, I went to a gun hire place. I knew the Sterling submachine gun. I loved the look of it. So I took that. I took in T-strip and I took in some other bits and lots of super glue. And uh, I found 
the sights that we put on the top. They're old military ones. And I stuck it all together with super glue, literally. And then I thought, well, this looks pretty cool. <laughs> and you could fire it. So oh, you yeah. get smoke and, and a light at the end. Then, and it answers one of the questions you asked me earlier on. I thought, you know what, Han Solo, he's the kind of icon character here. And George always said he's a Westerner. He's a Western cowboy, really, in space. So I found a Mauser, which I love the look of, and it, and it had a wooden stock. And I thought this would make a suitable gun. So again, I took more gun sights, stuck those on the top, stuck a bit on the end. And I, I called John Barry on the phone and said, you better bring George Lucas here and see what I'm doing, because I hadn't told them what I was doing. Mm. And again, I thought, well, he's going to come. I'm going to get fired now. Or, or, <laughs> but the direction or, <laughs> he gave you was that he was like a cowboy, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. yeah. so he looked at these, and we fired them and everything, and just smiled. That was, that was as m more than him cugging you. If you got a smile, that was it. So he stayed with me with super glue, and we made Princess Leia's gun together, the two of us. We were just sticking it together. I mean, that's how George was. How, and that's how it started. That's incredible. How did, and we, we're we're going to get Roger to read for sure. But now I'm it's, it's I'm back to my ten year old me. But 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 um, but how well, did uh, uh, how did um, just on answer that George Lucas makes his films for nine year olds. Yeah, he's always said that. He said it's not my fault. Adults like them as well. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it, it's. <laughs> what did anything change as they became successful and as you know the, obviously the money started to pile up and roll in did anything change the way you did things or the way the the, the pieces were put together was it more or, or was it still that slapdash did it always stay that way he, he kept that i mean the, the difference was people believed in george so they weren't being so obstructive to him all the time. But he always kept, I mean, on Phantom Menace, it, it was a hundred million dollar movie, yeah. which it was his own money. He didn't go to a studio. And they made most of it, all the pod race, because I was doing a lot of that. All the pod races were built. There is a lot of CGI in it, but he built as much as he could. And the atmosphere was the same. And, and um, Rick McCullum, the producer, halfway through he did an analysis of what it cost doing it that way doing it like students there were no executives on the set nothing it was the same basic way of shooting as it was on the first one and he did a costing if the film was done in America through the Hollywood system and it was exactly 400 million dollars so George always you know and even on that I spoke to him many times and he said you know we don't know we're going to get our money back so we're we're being very tight and careful. And I said, I, I think you'll get it back, but <laughs> I think you'll be okay now. But <laughs> they approached it the same way, huh. every film that he did. That's so interesting, you know? Yeah. Well, that's George. I mean, it's he's not, you know, he's never been part of Hollywood. He's lived where he lives yeah, and in the ranch. out of it. Yeah. And... He had such a tough time when he was starting. He's always kept that memory inside, and he just believes in filmmaking. And, and you know, whatever people say now, and they criticize the prequels and all of this, he created single handedly what became really, I, to me, I think he's created something the world can believe in when they're not believing so much in a lot of religions and what's going on in the world and politicians, he's given the world something because it's a perfect myth. He was able to write a perfect myth. It's good against evil, it's fun, it's got fantastic characters and you can follow and, and yeah. be part of. So it's very much, um, I think it's very much a creation of his and what there were, I'm, we're now just launching a documentary kind of based on this that will go be really behind the scenes because the fans never get it. All they get is the making ofs, which are mostly George and the toys and all of yeah. this stuff. There were five people on the original Star Wars. Ben Burt, who did all the sound, and I think everyone loves the sound. Yes. Ben Burt took a tape recorder on his own with a mic for a year and recorded pot-bellied pigs. He recorded bears, dogs barking, and he played them backwards because he wanted an organic sound. He didn't want science fiction-y sound. 
the lightsaber sound was an accident. He 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 was recording one day in his house, and he had an old cathode ray television. And he, as he went across the room, it went, and he went, "Oh, there it is." <laughs> That's basically oh. the lightsaber. <laughs> wow. And John Dykstra, who was given the task of George wrote, well, these spaceships are all flying and fighting and going down the Death Star um, in the ton on the channel. He had to invent, A, a computer that didn't exist, and then he, he had an idea about how to do multiple passes, so he created what was motion control. Again, these were beach boys, really. They got another job, but he was in garages in, in Los Angeles in the back of little places with very little money, and um, and John Barry obviously was the designer with, you know, he was trying to make things work with very little money. And w once we found Tunisia and other things that could pull it off. Um, and Ralph Macquarie, who was so shy, this man, he's brilliant, brilliant designer um, and illustrator. And they were his visions of what, George was writing. So in a way, George made it possible for us to, each one of us, to fulfill our dreams of what we thought it would be right. And because he was an independent director and because he made THX, we were able to do it and we weren't questioned. So that, yeah, yeah. I, I, I remember when, <clears throat> when I was a kid, I remember when you talk about the making ofs, I remember after the first Star Wars, there was a making of that was on ABC or something. And I remember watching it as a kid just going, oh, you know, I couldn't believe that it was done with things that you basically found around the house. Yeah. You know, like rolling a, the one thing, it was something rolling a ball down a tube with holes yes. in it and the light was coming through. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. like it was just so inventive and so creative, you know? Yeah, I mean, the lightsaber, once I'd found it, um, we thought maybe, and I'd done some work doing exhibitions and we painted blue screen paint, which was reflective. And I said, if we put a dowel, maybe if we paint it, we could get a bit of light. The DP said, no, I'm not doing that. We forced him to do it at the end of the day. And the, and they put in a motor that shimmered. It didn't just turn. It, it vibrated slightly. If you look at the makings of, you can see um, Alec Guinness is fighting Darth Vader with our wooden rods. And they keep breaking. But it gave them something <laughs> to hit against because none of them knew what would be replaced there wasn't a history of it. Now you can tell an actor this will be CGI, that'll be Yeah, that. that's oh, true. Oh, I know that. They had no reference. We had no reference to go on. Nobody. The sound, the vision, the nothing. Normally, if you make a film, you go and get, you know, you can get books. Yeah. There wasn't anything. Nothing. It's, it's literally, you're, you're making it from something that never existed. Yeah. And I mean, I love that. So yeah. <laughs> to me, it was Does, a joy. Could that, could that ever still happen? I don't know. I, um, Duncan Jones made a little film called Moon that he went back and did it all with miniatures and uh, did pretty well with a very low budget. I, I don't know that this can ever yeah. be the same moment in history because the you know, because of the lack of a belief in it from the studio, basically there wasn't much control coming in at the start anyway. Um, I, it, it just was that moment. I liken it all, you know, George has been called the only true living myth maker working today by Joseph Campbell. The hero's journey, it's his journey. That's what Star Wars is, it's the hero's journey. It It's all part of that same mythology and I think that came together like King Arthur came together yeah. at one moment. I doubt it'll happen again. We'd, uh, who would like to hear a reading from the book? I think we'd like to hear Roger read it. <laughs> so what we'll do while Roger is getting right here, we're going we're gonna to throw it out to you guys for some questions. We're going to have 10 or 15 minutes of questions from you guys. Um, you'll be able to uh, meet Roger and ask him questions at the table as well after because he'll be signing books and, and all that sorts of things. Uh, do you know what you'd like to read? Well, I, you have a choice. There's the uh, finding the um, basis of the lightsaber... Or there's a bit of outside the cantina in Tunisia when we were first doing it. I don't know if anyone would have a preference. Cantina? Okay, it cantina. seems good. Okay. So we're in, um, I'll preface this, it, Tunisia has the desert on one side and Gerba is an island 
it's about 12, 14 hour drive away. So we were in two bases and there's no cell phones. There was one phone and um, there'd been a terrible storm. The lines went down. They f crew in Gerber phoned London to tell me to get in the car and go there because the set was destroyed and flooded. And I drove through the night. I just had to go. So, And through the night, the production controller, I saw him driving at me as I was going. We were both doing 70 miles an hour. And he just went straight past. Boom. And I thought, if I turn around and go and try to stop him, it's going to take another 30 minutes. So I just keep going. Um, so when I got there, when I got there, we kind of got everything rebuilt, and um, on the exterior of the cantina, there's a massive crash spaceship, which is as big as a Boeing. If you look at the film, you'll see it, and that was in a Ralph Macquarie painting, and it happened to be at the exact location. There was one tree in this set, and we couldn't cut it down. It was like a, it would be in very. Uh, um, um, it, well, not very kind to the locals if we went and cut their only tree down. So we built this to hide it. Um, so I would say we kept going until the covered the till they covered the tree behind and other unsightly buildings. We used a forklift truck and suspended the huge jet engines we had mocked up into place, and then dressed in masses more pipes and airplane junk around them to make it looked like a crash car craft. Then the final work was with the painters who carefully aged it with spray paint and dust to make it look like distressed metal. What I'd done, again, because I couldn't afford, I, I took down the, we found a way to vac form the panels for the Death Star and we'd staple them on. That was what the Death Star was made of. So I thought those would be cool. So I took a load of those with me to Tunisia in the trucks. And I burnt them with a blowtorch and painted them, and I made it look like a crashed spaceship. So the cantina door had been given the Tatooine star looks by John Barry with a panel door frame. Outside, we set up a Western-style hitching post and brought in the dressing vehicles. These were the experimental speeders, painted down to look damaged and dusty. The owner of the building we had rented for the cantina entrance looked on in wonder at the transformation to his home. So this was a little hovel in the in the town he lived in. He would periodically come out from inside and look at the change with his eyes wide in astonishment. He didn't understand it was for a movie. Goodness knows what he thought, but he was getting paid a small rental fee and that seemed to make it okay. A moment I will never forget is when we unloaded the bantha from the truck and placed it into position as if tied to a hitching post by its owner who was inside the cantina drinking. This bantha was the only creature John could afford to make within the budget, so we took it around everywhere with us as dressing. That was the one in the desert the stormtroopers were riding, and then it came by truck. It was placed in the desert for the stormtroopers who were supposed to be riding banthas and then brought here. With the technology available within the limited time we had, the creature builders had managed to make its head move up and down when manoeuvred. It was covered in hide and hair, and when dusted down to make it fit into the location, it looked okay, especially in the distance. John Barry, the designer, was never really convinced by it, but he literally could not afford more. When it arrived by truck, the owner of the cantina location wasn't there and hadn't seen us place it. I was working nearby and watched his reaction when he came out of his house for his usual walk round to see what we were doing. He stopped dead in his tracks when he saw the creature, obviously deeply shocked. He ran back into his house and came straight back out with a huge club and started hitting the banther on the back. This, this made the head move up and down and convinced it was real. He carried on whacking the creature and shouting at it to go away. He was jumping around its head, shouting at it, careful not to let the creature bite him. <laughs> I was laughing and pleased that it had actually fooled him. Eventually he stopped and one of our locals went and explained to him what it was. He never came out without his club after that though. <laughs> And always eyed the bantha with a wary look. <laughs> that is great. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> See, it, it, you know, it was all you, they could afford, but it worked. Yeah. It fooled him. I mean, to, in perspective, again, a science fiction movie normally has a year in preparation to build everything. Fox greenlit the movie on December the 22nd. We moved into the big studio on January the 4th, and we oh. were shooting in March. Wow. So we were just scrambling. I never had a day off. I, I literally would go home at night and choose between three takeaways. Then it was pretty primitive. There was a takeaway spud you like, which you got a potato <laughs> baked with cheese on it. Chinese or Indian, that was it. Wow. <laughs> Um, we're going to open it up for uh, some questions. We have like, uh, you know, 15 minutes or so uh, for questions. Don't forget, you can also ask Roger a question as you're, uh, as you're getting uh, your book signed. Uh, who, who would like to ask a question first? Yes, go ahead. Uh -huh. What was it? Sorry? Uh, what was it like with H.R. Giger? Oh, Giger on Alien. Um, um, he came down for two weeks because he didn't believe in films and when he saw what we were doing he stayed for the entire shoot and uh, he was fantastic to work with very dedicated and I mean his paintings are brilliant so we had him do as much as we could I had lunch with him every day and I had to translate things like toad in the hole because he couldn't understand the English pub <laughs> what what <laughs> And I won't say the other one because there's children here. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was was it, w w like when it comes to was that that was a different was that a different budget obviously for Alien than not really. Wow. They, they 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 no. It's the first science fiction horror film ever made, so they had no faith in that working. Um, so they they put up six million dollars for that huge film, and six weeks before shoot, pulled six hundred thousand dollars out of our budget. So again, I mean, just Ridley had. I knew him anyway, and I worked with him, and uh, he knew what I'd done to create the Millennium, Millennium Falcon. So I just bought endless scrap drain pipes. I, you know, I could buy PVC water piping in all different sizes. That's basically what a lot of that is, and just made that look. That's so incredible. And everything was shot. There's no CGI. I mean, it was all models shot mm -hmm. in a little studio afterwards. Where, where does, where, what's your take on CGI? It, well, it's it's a, it's a the toy box is open mm -hmm. now. You can do anything. Um, having seen what they're doing now with the new Star Wars, Avatar, all these films, you can really do anything. Um, I just think it's audiences aren't stupid. They watch, and there's certain things that are real that you believe in, and there's certain, you know at the end of the day. Human beings can't fly. Yeah. <laughs> they know that. So those. <laughs> All of that CGI, it, it's become a tool that American studios just say, oh, we'll fix it in, studio, in CGI. Well, you don't want to do that because there's accidents when you're filming. There's dust, there's things happen, and the more real it is, and I don't care how much they say or oh, actors could get used to it, they don't. When they're handling things, when guns are heavy like ours, the lightsaber was heavy, there's a difference. And um, the more, and they're going back. I mean, JJ did a lot more yeah. real building, and he didn't have a lot of time on his. Disney cut a year off their their filmmaking um, because they had a schedule for it, and they just took instead of three years, which he had, they made him do it in two. Oh. So CGI is, you know, used correctly. I, I, I mean, I love Lord of the Rings. If you look at Lord of the Rings, it's beautifully done and it's beautifully made. And the CGI, you never know. It's just part of that world. And I mm -hmm. think when it's used like that, then it's fantastic for us. Another question uh, in the middle here? Uh, similar to the story that you just shared with us with the creature in the cantina, do you have any similar experiences or have you witnessed a similar experience, funny story like that with David Browse and Darth Vader? Hashi? A few. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <coughs> Dave, Dave was really upset, you know, that George didn't use his voice. That's when they fell out because he thought he should be Darth Vader. But as I said, that, that it was a Somerset voice, basically, from the West Country. Um, the, the, it, it relates to the special effects again because they got over enthusiastic, putting in explosions in when they had to come through one, one stormtroopers, and I was there on the set, there was a huge explosion 
everything blacked out. You could just hear clonking, stormtroopers, people swearing. The first thing is everyone rushed in and said, is everybody okay? They were okay. And again, the special effects guy walked in front and said, it's these art departments, they make weak sets. <laughs> and blamed us. But in fact, he just put in way too much explosion. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Um, up there in the back, yes? When did you get your start? What, what brought you or pulled you into to the cre that creative side of, of the movie industry? Where did you, did you come from an art background? Did you come from a, you know, from a, a sort of an apprentice background where you just happened to, to tag onto a movie studio or production or? No, I, um, there's a common denominator amongst directors as well that we all hated school. <laughs> We're pretty <laughs> bad in school. And you have I put that in perspective when I see my son at school now. It's fantastic. We got beaten every day. We got rulers slammed on us. We, they, the teachers hated children, basically. So I revolted against it, except for the art department. And the art, art teacher just took me under his wing. And I got out at 16, I got two, two exams, that's all I passed. In a year, when I was out being treated like a human being, I got four, six more immediately in a year. And I, I went into art school, because that led into art school. My father, by the way, wouldn't talk to me uh, for years. I, I was ordered to be a priest, a doctor, or an architect, and that was it. And this was not long after the war, so he had his reasons. Um, and I came through and I s went to London with a f um, one of my friends in the um, art college bought this old Jaguar for 50 pounds and we decided to go to London in this thing and we watched Dr. Zhivago and A Man and a Woman and it that was it. I came out and said, I don't care, I'm going into this industry, this is what I have to do. And uh, it took me years. I, I had to do architecture because I couldn't get a job. I knew nobody in the industry. I did two years of architecture and just kept going and going. And while I was a student, I was putting up marquees to earn money in the summer. And we saw a concentration camp where we were working in this forest. And I thought, wow, this is real. What's going on here? And I went over and asked them. And they said, yeah, well, there's a tramp come by and gives us, which is a, a, a hobo gives us food every day he thinks we're in prison here and I said what is this and he said it's for a film set and I was going wh wh where wh how are you and he said it's over there Pinewood is behind the trees so I got under the fence I escaped got in there and they were shooting the first James Bond film and I think the smell and this watching the lights and the filming and everything going on that was it I hit my holy grail and I had to get in and by sheer I got so broke that I sold a little car I had and I thumbed a lift home and an architect picked me up and felt sorry for me, he took me all the way home and he said, you know, somebody I employed in my office worked on Cleopatra, I'll ask them, call me in three days and he was true to his word. I called him and he said, I'm, he's introducing you to an art director who did a very fine TV series called um, Department S. I went to see him with my folder and he said, yeah, I'd take you on, but we're just finishing the series. I'm sorry. And I found out he did the Ice Palace, the entire sets on Zhivago. And he said, the designer of that is starting a new film. I've made an appointment for you to see him. And uh, I went down there. I think I got a moped that I could get there because it was in the country and I uh, borrowed one. And this sums it up as well, and it brings it all back round to where we started, because he looked at my folder of work, I had all these drawings, everything, he shut it up, he said, listen, I'll give you a job if you're prepared to make the tea. And I said, oh, yes, tea, coffee, whatever, <laughs> I'll do it. And it was like, I think, it was like 10 pounds a week. But he shut the folder and he said, let me tell you about the film industry, you're in the desert, you're the designer, and there's an aeroplane next to you, and the car arrives, and out gets a producer and a director, and they go, wow, this is great. And he said, you've got a bottle of green ink in your pocket. And they say, it's fine. Can you have it read by tomorrow morning? Hmm. And he said, you either talk your way out of it then and there and offer a solution, or you do it. That's the film industry. And I that's, think that sums it up. That is a great so that's how I got that 
for, uh, he he mentored me all the way through this man John Box he's the most wonderful designer and uh he did Lawrence of Arabia Dr Zhivago Oliver all, all these films that I worked on that and um really shaped my future and my career he was a very kind man he's a good friend to make that's for sure yeah, yeah oh, because wow. You know, I arrived from art school. I had hair down here, and I was wearing Cuban <laughs> boots and jeans. And the, every day, they were all in suits and ties, saying, "Come on, get your hair cut. You've got to shape <laughs> up. You can't be like this." And I would talk about all these foreign films. I loved art cinema. I loved, you know, all the European films. I was in the cinema everywhere. I said, "Forget all this. This is you don't need all this stuff. This is a career. Get on the drawing board. Get your head down and start working and everything." And hmm. I made the decision I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> and you know, they're not sitting here. No, <laughs> <of people under>. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, so, what do you think of the Star Wars films now? Um, I t I actually loved A Force Awakens. I thought JJ gave back to the fans the Star Wars they loved and revered, and I think he did an amazing job. I just because the legacies continued. I agree with one thing. Um, uh, James Cameron, the Avatar director, and all of these said, and he said, JJ's a great friend of mine, and I don't want to denigrate him or what he's done. He said, but when I look at the six films that George Lucas did, there's more creativity, more influence in cinema in those six films than in Force Awakens, which is true, but he had, he had to bring it back. Um, and I think he kept, he's very respectful of the mythology. I think there's a lot under the surface that is what you absorb in a cinema, even though you're not realizing you're absorbing, which is the hero's journey. You know, and I loved Rogue One. I thought it was great, but it's an action movie. It's not, it's not a mythological Star Wars movie, which I think Force Awakens will continue that um, kind of the saga. And I think the next one will. I was kind of relieved that JJ has taken over the last one because I, I wasn't too keen on Jurassic Park. It had great CGI, but not much else. So Star Wars needs that core story. And it's the Skywalker family and uh, what happens. So, you know, there is, there is a, a global army of fans out there who are attached to this saga. So I think he was very respectful of that. We'll take one more question, if anyone is. Uh, yeah, at the back there. You can stand up so we can hear you better, if that's okay. As you know, uh, Solo, Han Solo is getting his uh, new spin-off movie. Um, is there any other character who you'd want to see have a, their own spin-off oh. see their origin? I do, yeah. I want to see Boba Fett. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I think Obi-Wan Kenobi would be very interesting because really he's like the Buddhist master who we don't know much about him really. And I think he would be really interesting. Yeah. Boba <laughs> Fett, my favorite <laughs> character. Slay one. Yeah, anyway. he needs a film. Yes, absolutely. Uh, right, we'll, let Roger, we'll let Roger get out there first before everyone else leaves. How about a, a big huge hand for Roger Christian? Everybody? Thank you, everybody. <laughs> They wanted me to show you something. Okay. There's something wrapped in. I just thought this was your kefia. That's what I. Hey, everybody. Uh, I had to make several for the film. This is one of them. So, because uh, I was going to bring it out. If we had a lightsaber question, I was going to bring it out then. But. Uh, <laughs> oh, you want a picture? <laughs> that is a, so just let's can I just I, I don't want to <laughs> it actually doesn't it doesn't feel it just, doesn't feel like any big deal just don't, um, no it's amazing just don't press the red button <laughs> <laughs> and and what what am I holding here tell us what we're holding this uh, the the handle was a is a graplex which is a piece of a 1940s flash camera <laughs> that was the press use. You see them in all the movies. Whenever they're doing press, they're taking photographs in the period. That had a silver disc on the top. Um, 
this this was the hardest thing if i've got two seconds mm -hmm. that was the hardest thing to find because i knew it was the icon of star wars and um wow. they kept haranguing me saying we need one in the desert it's got to hang on his belt and i hadn't found anything i looked all my scrap and i had so much scrap i collected i had two offices i filled one up and went to another one and um, in desperation i i made luke's binoculars by hand and i needed two lenses for the front so i went to a photography shop in london where i could always rent equipment and i bought two cheap lenses to stick on the front and david french the owner knew me well because i got all my equipment i said david have you got anything here that might be interesting a camera part something pointed me to some old boxes under a shelf that he said i haven't touched those i don't know 20 15 years dusty and the first one i pulled out I opened the paper and there was this, which had the basis here and I just went, oh, I found it. And I could never design that. I could never have made something that was, yeah. I, I think, you know, sufficient to be worthy of a Jedi and the weapon. And I rushed back. I took some of the T-strip from the um, Stormtrooper's gun I'd broken down some calculators I'd found, <laughs> and uh, this here was would magnify the numbers, so you could read them. Oh, yeah, and I thought, yeah. oh, that's right. That that looks really cool. I'll put that <laughs> on there, and we put a, a D ring on the end, so to hang it on Luke's belt. And I, again, I called George over and said, George, you better come and look. I think I might have found it. And again, he just took it, felt the weight of it, and just a huge grin on his face. Oh. And that was it. It's it's funny that <laughs> every kid that I grew up with once and 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 made their own lightsaber, you know, out of whatever they had in the house, kind of like what you did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's that's how it. You know, I I think there's something. Um, I don't know. It's organic. I rest is the right word. Yeah. It's the organic process that feels right. And we knew that. I knew that this would be. And the icon of that first film but and it's interesting if you watch carefully force awakens and the new one that lightsaber isn't this one they changed it a little bit for um the sequel for empire strikes back and i don't think they could find any more of these yeah there's no more calculators kicking no and they did something that i would never have done which is they 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 screwed these down and they've got little um, rivets in them. See, I would never do that. I, I don't think a Jedi weapon should have rivets in it. It should be more like that, but uh, that's the only difference. Otherwise, it's it's exactly the same as, as um, this is this is exactly, it, it's, I made a few of them. This is exactly what came out of Obi-Wan's box and he presented to Luke as his father's weapon. Okay, everyone, this is pretty cool. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roger Christian. Thank you, everybody.